So, thank you everyone for continuing to come to ECS 173, Introduction to Image Processing and Analysis. If you missed Friday, uh, which I know you may have, then that was basically an introduction to the course, and in particular, uh, basically a broad overview of how the course works, uh, what we're going to be covering, kind of a broad sense, and then why it's important to think about. So today we're going to dive right in. And as I described on Friday, the way the course works is that the first three weeks are dedicated to photographs and video. The second three weeks are dedicated to 3D surface data, such as you would get from a radar detector. And the last three weeks are on volumetric medical images that form a 3D volume. So today we're going to dig right in and start talking about photographs. And we're going to start at the very bottom. So like I talked about, um, there's a notion in this field of uh, a semantic ladder where, or a hierarchy, where at the top end of the ladder are properties of images that you extract from images that are very kind of cerebral or abstract, and at the very bottom are very numerical properties. So we're going to start at the very numerical end and work our way up over the course of the next couple of weeks. So uh, in particular, we're going to talk about this thing called Fourier analysis, um, AKA the Fourier transform. The big idea, why it's an important thing to think about, and um, some of its properties. And I, I like to think that when I was taught Fourier analysis, uh, I was taught it in a way that was much more complicated than it needed to be. And basically, there's a big idea that gets obscured really easily in um, a lot of courses. So after that, um, I'm going to do some very brief announcements. There's not that many today. And then after that, we're going to talk about a kind of a step up from the Fourier analysis, which are called wavelets. And get used to this kind of format. What I was told one time is that um, the uh, student attention span, or the, your ability to pay attention to a lecture, I guess it's not really just students, but it's anybody, uh, is very high in the beginning of a lecture because you assume that that's when the most important bits of information are going to be, it kind of flags in the middle, and then it goes up again towards the end. As, as though, you know, depending on the lecturer style, you might start off with a bang and then have details, or you might have the content kind of rise up and rise until the very end, bang. The point is that there's nothing interesting going on in the middle. So what I try to do in the middle of my lectures is go through kind of the administrative uh, stuff that doesn't require a lot of brain power on your part. Okay, so let us consider the following image. This is an image of the human brain. It's um, an image of the brain that is taken at about this level going in this direction. So if you go a little bit lower in the brain, you'd start to see ears right here and eyeballs up there. The back of the head is back here. And now let's consider what happens if we draw a line shown in green from the top of this image to the bottom and think about what the intensities are of the pixels along that line. And furthermore, let's say that we have a way that we want to visualize the intensities of the pixels that are along that line. And we do that by graphing it out like this. So what, we're going to, what I'm trying to show here is that bright pixels have relatively high values along this curve going from left to right, and that dark pixels have relatively low values on this curve. So the bright parts of the image, or the bright parts of this line, I should say, are sort of like the mountains, and the dark parts of the image are sort of like the valleys. And if you kind of walk your way along this image as it goes from, I think actually this is going from bottom to top. We'll see in the following slides if I get this right. But what you should see is that there's some kind of dark stuff over here, which corresponds to that. And then there's this bright business up here that covers the first part of the curve. And that's roughly that. Then there's this dark trough in the middle. This is called the lateral ventricles of your brain, which is not important. The point is it's dark. And that's this middle section here. And then as you, if you keep walking along this line, you get to bright stuff again. Bright, bright, bright. And then right at the very tippy top, there's more dark stuff. So it goes down. This is going to be a common representation of imaging data. Uh, which is common because it makes things easier to um, demonstrate on, on, in a simple case. And in general, what I'm going to do I think a few times in this class is uh, demonstrate image processing algorithms on 
this kind of representation as a way to show you how it works, but then it's always applicable to two-dimensional or three-dimensional data. So if we look at this slice of imaging data and then um, consider it, we may then wonder how uh, it is possible to describe this image. So one way you can think about this is let's say you wanted to tell the story of this imaging data mathematically. And in particular, you have this goal that we talked about a little bit on Friday, which is that you want to describe the imaging data in such a way that it is intelligible and concise. So in other words, let's say that I gave you the task of representing this piece of imaging data with the smallest number of numbers possible. Well, one way you might consider to do it is to say, well, all right, let's say I want to represent this, this slice of imaging data. How could I do it? Well, one way you can think about it is that at a very, and this is a different slice of imaging data, but same idea. Uh, one thing you can do is just, cons is just look at the thing and say, all right, well, if I really squint and back up and look at this thing in a blurry way, there's a kind of a higher part of the intensities and then a lower part of the intensities. But then if I move in a little bit closer and look at it at a more fine-grained level of detail, you will see that there are these bumps in the imaging data that have a kind of a characteristic width to them. There's one right here, there's one right here, there's another one right here, and there's another one right here. And furthermore, kind of in between those two, there are these fluctuations in the data that kind of have this kind of shape to them. There's one right here and one right there, and then if you just flip that thing upside down, you get another one there, there, and there. So what I've just done in plain English is to tell the story of this particular slice of imaging data in terms of three different components. A slowly varying one that starts off roughly, roughly very high and roughly, roughly goes very low. There's a fine grained kind of dip in the data that's there, there, there and so on. And then there are these big fluctuations in the data that are there, 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 and there. So three different components of the imaging data. So showing that pictorially, you can think about representing the imaging data in terms of the summation of three different components, all of which have different what's called frequency. So frequency tells you how quickly the imaging data fluctuates from uh, low to high values, and use the mic. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask, are we assuming that they're all of the same amplitude, or is that just No, we're not. I'm just, we're, I'm just showing that for this example. So, uh, and, and you can see that these three different curves that I'm showing on the right over here, first of all, hopefully you can recognize that those are sinusoidal curves. And you can see that they represent the three different things that I was talking about. This guy down here represents the low, uh, or the slowly varying high to low thing going on. And you can see it goes from high to low. This one over here represents those little tight dips that happen. And the other one shows the other component of what I was talking about. So here we're, we're really boiling down the data into these three different components. And that's what I'm talking about when I say tell the story of imaging data. You're trying to describe it using a small number of pieces or a small number of parts. So the big idea here is that images, either slices of imaging data as I'm talking about now, or full images as we are, we'll see in a couple of slides, they can be modeled as sums of sinusoids that have varying frequency in terms of you know, how quickly they fluctuate and varying magnitudes, which I will show you shortly. And in fact, uh, the reason why this is called Fourier analysis is that there was a French mathematician named Fourier that showed that essentially any image or any signal that, that uh, fluctuates over a domain can be modeled using uh, sinusoidal curves. It might take infinitely many of them, fine, but it can be done. And that's why this, is, this, why, this, that, that's why this kind of way of thinking about images has uh, Dr. Fourier's name attached to them. So, um, and just as in a little bit more detail, image intensities that vary quite a bit over a very small amount of space, call it high frequencies, and intensities that vary gradually and slowly over a domain, call that low frequencies. So that's kind of the big idea of 
of uh, Fourier analysis. In contrast, you might other represent upper, other presentations of this material might dive right into the math, and it, this whole idea just kind of gets lost. Is this clear? Okay, good. Now, um, in terms of why we would bother thinking about images in this way, it's actually um, a very easy question to answer. It's that both quickly changing intensities and s gradually changing intensities can tell you things about what the contents of the images are at some kind of a higher level. In particular, if I tell you that there is a dark, dark spot in the middle of the image that's surrounded by bright and bright, what I'm essentially telling you is that there, is, there are two zones in the image, right here and here, where the image intensity varies quickly from dark to bright. So quickly changing intensities, when I say quickly, I mean moving quickly from, from one pixel to the next, uh, those might be interesting to you because they tell you a thing about edges, which is to say boundaries between one region and another. So quickly changing intensities can be interesting to you. Also, um, if you were to take a photograph of a plaid shirt, like we talked about last time, or a shirt with stripes on it, you will see that in between the stripes there are quick changes in image intensity. And throughout the plaid there are going to be these up and down changes in image intensity from bright to dark. And it's those changes that tell you things about the fact that it's plaid as opposed to it being just flatly colored. Now, the flip side of that is that uh, quickly changing image intensities might be a distraction as well. So if you just focus your attention to the image intensities that are within the dark region right here, you'll notice that they are not perfectly flat. There is this thing called image noise. It's in every image. It's in every image that you have ever taken. And it's especially in every image that you have ever taken with a mobile device. What, it's, what that means is that if you take an if you take a photograph of a stop sign, not even if it's the lighting is perfect and uh, you are standing perfectly still, it's not the case that every pixel in that image will have exactly the same value. They will fluctuate a little bit. Just because the, the mobile device or the CCD camera that you're using um, was cheaply constructed and the optics are cheap and nothing is perfect. And in fact, even if you did have a very expensive camera, the image intensities wouldn't be exactly the same either because there's never perfect certainty in anything that you measure about anything. So it's a long-winded way of saying that these fluctuations in image intensity down here, they are high-frequency changes in the value of intensities, but they don't mean anything. They, are not, they don't tell you anything about what's in the image itself. So they might be distraction. And by the way, this is going to be a recurring theme in this class, is that there is no free lunch. There's no way of providing a solution to an image processing problem that doesn't beget other image processing problems. And with every uh, algorithm that we talk about, there's going to be gotchas. So get used to it. So um, you can probably think imagine why slowly changing image intensities are a useful thing to keep track of as well. So for one thing, if you take an image that is blurry and you've got your stop sign and you have your, um, your telephoto lens and you haven't quite focused it properly, you will be able to tell that you haven't focused it properly by the fact that instead of the image intensities going from red, 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 red to perfectly blue, they kind of gradually change from reddish, reddish, reddish to bluish, bluish, bluish in the fuzzy penumbra around the boundary of your stop sign. So if you detect that the image intensities are varying kind of slowly, you can detect the fact that you have a blurry image. And also, if you remember on Friday, I showed you a photograph of my nephew. It was taken with a flash in a dark room. And one of the things that I pointed out is that you, with your highly evolved, highly trained brain and eye system, were probably able to pick up the fact that it was taken with a flash because on the white background of the wall, the, there was a very bright white spot that faded gradually into dark. So that's another example of gradually changing image intensities from white, white, white to darker, 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 darker. That tells you something interesting about the contents of the image and then therefore you might want to keep track of.
And also, uh, if you just want to interpret an image of a scene, and it has walls, and people, and a floor, and clouds, and um, motorcycles in it, uh, you may want to keep track of the fact that the walls are in one part of the image based on the fact that the image intensity does not change very quickly. Most walls tend to be flatly shaded. So that's kind of the big idea. So now that you have the big idea, let's talk about the math a little bit. So first of all, I'm going to represent my slice of imaging data as a function f with a one-dimensional domain, f of x. So f of x gives me the image intensity at any point x along this line. Now, uh, what I told you is that I have a set of sinusoidal curves. I'll call them g1, g2, and g3. Uh, all, each of them are on a one-dimensional domain x as well. And that, getting back to your question about magnitude, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, uh, my g's are all going to have the same amplitude. And in order to fit the imaging data properly, I'm going to modulate that amplitude. So I'm basically going to take my original g1 and I'm going to scale it in the y direction by multiplying it by some constant f1. Similarly, I'm going to take my g2, which started out at the same exact scale as g1, and I'm going to multiply it and scale it by some other constant f2. Similarly with f3. So then, what I can tell you is that this function f, that was my original imaging data, is well approximated, or maybe it's exactly represented, by the summation over these three functions, g1, g2, and g3, of this product, fi times gi. So we just sum those guys together. Now, um, let's talk about terminology just for a minute. This is often called the Fourier transform of the image. Because if you think about it in a particular way, um, this process of summing together these three modulated sinusoidal functions can be thought of as transforming the imaging data f into the coefficient capital F. And the reason it's thought of as in, in that way is that really, um, if you can exactly represent little f in terms of the big Fs, you can transform from the little f, which is your imaging data, to the big F, which is your Fourier, they call them Fourier coefficients. And you can go from one direction to the other. So and like I said, just, okay, just taking a, another step back for a minute, when the G functions are sinusoidal in shape, this is referred to as the Fourier transform. But since Fourier, there's been a series of other um, they call them basis functions, but a, a, a set of other functions that you can use instead of sinusoids. So you might see something called, for example, a Z-transform, which is similar in terms of the mechanics of it, but they just use a different set of functions, not sinusoids. That's kind of a detail. So uh, and in terms of terminology, you analyze the input imaging data F by looking at the capital Fs, and you can synthesize the image again by going from the capital F to the little f. So you can really go in one direction and the other. So um, one, and actually, one way that you can think of this as being a useful thing is um, let's imagine that you have taken a one-dimensional photograph with your cell phone, and you want to send it to your friend's cell phone. And let's say, in particular, that you have taken this one-dimensional photograph, if you can bear with me. It has a number of different values. Let's say that there are 100 different intensities from here to here. Well, what I've just told you is that you can essentially just send your friend F1, F2, and F3. And if your friend knows what G1, G2, and G3 are, then that person can recreate the image from, from just those coefficients. So in fact, this is why the Fourier transform became um, so ubiquitous is that it's um, the most, one of the most useful things in telecommunication technology. And in fact, the fact that you can do the Fourier transform quickly is, I don't know if it's the reason, but it's one of the big reasons why we have massive telecommunications networks, period. So um, this, this gives rise to a couple of questions, which are, first of all, what should these functions g be? And I've told you that they're sinusoids. 
Um, but then also, how do you get the capital F from the little f? And I'm going to talk about those next. Well, um, let's say that we have a big set of sinusoidal functions. How would we characterize this big set of sinusoidal functions? Well, each one can be characterized by its frequency omega. And everybody, hopefully everyone knows what the frequency of a sinusoidal function is. Um, or equivalently, its period, which is to say how long does it take to it to go from over its whole cycle and back to the beginning point. And then if you have a large set of these covering many, many different frequencies, then um, the formula for synthesizing the imaging data back from the original sinusoidal functions is, is this. So <clears throat> if you have a large set of these frequencies, you can just add all of the contributions of them together to get back the original image. And if you want to be um, very mathematically rigorous about it, you can consider the abstract case of having infinitely many of these sinusoidal functions. So not just where you have a stack of 20 of them, but you have infinitely many covering all possible frequencies. If you have that, then this sum turns into an integral. And you simply integrate over all possible sinusoidal frequencies and add them all together, infinitely many of them, to get back the imaging data. And then to do analysis, what you basically do is take the inner product of the imaging data with each one of those sinusoidal functions, which is just this over again. It's basically you switch the positions of the big F and the little f. So if you start out with uh, an image and a set of sinusoidal functions, you basically do a bunch of inner products in order to get what your Fourier coefficients are. And then if you have a bunch of Fourier coefficients and sinusoidal functions, you do a bunch of inner products to get back the imaging data. So it's very, very symmetrical going from imaging data to these coefficients and then going from the coefficients back to the imaging data again. Any questions at this point? OK, good. So um, let's try to wrap our heads around the idea of how exactly this extends to two-dimensional data. Photographs, harder to draw. But uh, what I'd like you to consider is a two-dimensional sinusoidal function uh, where basically the sine, the sinusoidal curve fluctuates in a particular one particular direction. So in this case, it fluctuates in this direction. If you imagine I take a line that cuts through the image like that then you will see a one-dimensional sine curve out of it. And so basically, the way to represent this mathematically is that you have a, a two-dimensional domain of x and y and two parameters u and v that give you basically what the orientation of that fluctuation is, whether it's oriented with the x-axis, 45-degree angle, oriented with the y-axis, But now, what I'd like you to keep track of is the fact that uh, all of the math of how you do synthesis and how you do analysis, how you go from imaging data to coefficients and back again, is exactly the same, except you add a dimension to it. So if you have imaging data and these two-dimensional sinusoidal functions, you basically do an inner product which is just the same kind of summation of products of things, but over two dimensions. And you just add them all up. So in other words, you take the inner product again of the imaging data and the basis, or the sinusoidal function. That gives you your coefficients big F. But now notice that each pair of frequencies, U and V, give you a coefficient F. So before we had one coefficient for every frequency omega. Now we have two frequencies, so we have one coefficient for each one of those. So that's analysis, which is to say starting from imaging data and getting coefficients out of it. So if you want to then recreate the imaging data based on the coefficients you have, you again do the same thing you did in the one-dimensional case, which is that you swap out the imaging data for the coefficients and you do an inner product again. You just take the, for each one of your coefficients, you take the inner product of that with its 
uh, sinusoidal function, and then you add all those together, and the original image pops out. So I like to present the 1D case because I think it's easier to think about, but then once you show the math in 1D, then you can take a step from there to the math in 2D without that much extra effort. And by the way, if I were to present the math in 3D, I don't think I do. I don't. Uh, suffice to say, everything happens the same way in 3D. You simply have sinusoids that cover three dimensions. You have one coefficient for each such sinusoidal curve. Add them all together. To do uh, analysis, you take inner products of the imaging data with that. To do synthesis, you do inner products of the coefficients with the, basic, with the sinusoidal functions. Everything stays the same when you go from one dimension to two dimension to three. Now, any questions? Yeah. Could this potentially be done with any picture, or does the picture have to have some sort of regularity to it? No. This is the amazing thing about the Fourier transform is that, <clears throat> is that uh, any image can be represented using uh, Fourier coefficients. Now, the, um, the gotcha, however, is that it could take arbitrarily many of them. So in particular, if you, have a very, if you have very sharp edges that go from perfectly black to perfectly white, that can take thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Fourier coefficients to represent properly. So the answer is basically yes and no, in that technically it's possible, practically only kind of sort of. Any other questions at this point? Yeah. Is the 3D transform used? Much at all. So um, when we get to um, volumetric medical data, it actually turns out that acquiring one of these filled in 3D scans of the brain is really quite noisy. And so we're in that situation that I described where there are fluctuations in the data that are not interesting because they're, it's just so noisy. So you can remove those by looking at the Fourier transform. Anything else? Okay. So um, I'm not sure why exactly this happened, but th a method was presented for how to visualize a Fourier transform and the results of doing a Fourier transform such that uh, we put the coefficients that we get out, capital F, on a two-dimensional grid like this one. Uh, where the low frequency sinusoids are in the m sort of near the middle, and the high frequency sinusoids are towards the uh, periphery, and in fact, there's going to be a slot in each one of these two-dimensional arrays for each capital F for each one of those Fourier coefficients for every possible sinusoidal curve. So what you will see when you look at these represent graphical representations of it is that. In images that have a lot of slowly varying components, the stuff in the middle of it will be relatively bright, which means that the Fourier coefficients are relatively large. Meanwhile, in images that have a lot of high frequency components, uh, what you will find is that the periphery of those images is relatively bright, representing the fact that the magnitude of those Fourier coefficients is relatively large. So again, I'm not sure what prompted this field to go in this direction, but that's just the convention. And so what you will see if you, um, for example, what you can do is go into MATLAB, and you can do this in ITK as well, but it's really easy to do in MATLAB. Um, you can take a photograph of anything and do a Fourier transform of it in 2D, and then look at the Fourier transform in, in this way. So this just gives one example of one image where um, Basically, that point represents what happens when you analyze the image using uh, this sinusoidal function. This point represents the magnitude of the coefficient you get out when you analyze it with that uh, sinusoidal function, and so on. And kind of the, the gist here is that different images will have different sinusoidal functions that play a role in representing it. I know that's a vague term, but that's how you should think about it, is that 
there are some sinusoids that are major players in, in images and other ones that are not. And we'll, we'll go through some examples uh, that show that. So here's one example where we have this photograph of the cheetah and we look at the Fourier transform of it. And what you should see is that there's a big chunk or there's a big percentage of the image that is kind of slowly varying. And then there are these kind of there's a little bit of the image that's kind of out towards the periphery, but just in generally speaking, what happens when you go from the center to the periphery is that kind of the amount of uh, stuff that's in the periphery gets lower as you get as you get closer to it. And I think that probably represents the fact that a lot of the image is kind of relatively flat. Yeah, there are the spots, but uh, they're at a relatively regular frequency, and so uh, not every frequency under the sun is going to be implicated in this particular image. Here's another example. So let's think about what happens when we go from the, this image to this one. Basically what happens is that we have blurred out some of the edges. So it should be obvious that instead of uh, going from a, from a black pixel right here and taking one step to the right and shooting down into a something that's very different, gray, we get a much more gradual transition from black to grayish to grayish to grayish to grayish. So going back to what we were talking about in the one-dimensional example, what's basically happening is that we're taking high-frequency aspects of the image and we're moving it. So how should that play itself out in our Fourier transform, do you think? Well, what I told you is that the high frequency components of the image are represented towards the periphery of the Fourier transform. So probably what's going to happen if we remove high frequency components of the image, we're going to remove the high frequency components of the Fourier transform. And you should see that. It should look like there is this blob of stuff in this Fourier transform and it gets squished towards the middle. Yeah. I'm confused why the constriction is only in one direction. Why? It is. So actually, it's, it's difficult for the human eye to pick this out. But what has happened is that, uh, actually, can, can I see some examples of that? It's hard to see. But maybe here is one where actually edges in that go from, let's see, edges that run in this direction are relatively less blurred. And edges that are in this direction are relatively blurred. Are, are blurred more. So maybe you can tell that, that, the, that this part of the ear is very blurry and this part of the ear is not very blurry. But that's what's going on here. That makes this, this example a little bit more complicated than I wanted. But uh, what's happening is that you're blurring the image in one direction, which is causing it to just squish in one direction this way as opposed to squish in both. But th I think the, the general idea here is that uh, if you remove a particular kind of frequency from your image, you remove that kind of frequency from your Fourier transform. Any other questions? Okay. Here's another example. Oh, actually, no, this is, this is good. So this one, we are literally removing all of the high frequency uh, components from all different directions. And what you should see here, what would be great is if I could do this on both kinds of operations on the same image. So you can see what happens when you remove just one direction of edge as opposed to both. But anyway, you get the idea that uh, the image on the left is much more sharp in all different directions compared to the image on the right. And that's because I have artificially removed all of the high frequency information from it and kept just the low frequency stuff. So again, the Fourier transform tells the story of your image in some sense, and the graphical depiction of it tells that story in a little bit more uh, immediate or intuitive way. Here are some more examples. Uh, we have a brick wall and its Fourier transform, and then a set of blocks and its Fourier transform. So one uh, puzzle for you all it's not much of a puzzle because I'm about to tell you the answer, but uh, can anyone tell me why the 
uh, Fourier transform of the blocks or sugar cubes or whatever they are has that stripy stuff coming out of it. Yeah. Because of like the large amounts of like solid gray, because of the large amounts of solid gray area, depending on which direction you're headed, you you're consistent more often. Yeah. So I think maybe to hopefully rephrase what you were uh, saying is that there are a set of dominant directions of edges in the image. So it's not the case that we see a large amount of edges in every possible orientation that we, you could possibly imagine. But basically, there's a large amount of edges in this direction, and 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 this direction. You could count off on maybe two hands, or two hands and a foot, uh, all of you could count out all of the different edge orientations in the image. For each one of those edge directions, there is one such stripe that corresponds to a sinusoidal function that is in that orientation. So for example, I'm not sure which one corresponds to which, but it could be that this set of pixels it's what is what's driving uh, this stripe of, or actually no, probably this stripe of the Fourier transform kind of lighting up. Because this set of uh, sinusoids are all oriented in that direction, if you will. So that's what's going on, is that there is a small set of dominant gradient, sorry, dominant edge directions. And so the sinusoids that align with that thing tell the story of, the, I keep referring to that phrase, it, tell the story of the image in that way. So uh, what's with the blocks that we just talked about that? A couple more examples just for your amusement. Uh, here's the Fourier transform of a set of, uh, of, of letter images. Uh, I think it, you, know, you can probably look at each one of these, or some of them anyway, and come up with your own notion of why the Fourier transform looks the way it does. And possibly the easiest one is to say, OK, why does the Q look different than everybody else? And I'll leave that as an exercise up to you to determine why it is that the Fourier transform for the letter Q looks different than the Fourier transform for all those other letters. And then just as a, to turn the previous example on its head, here's what happens when you remove all the low frequency information from the middle there and show just the high frequency information, which uh, maybe you can kind of see now. Yeah, right. Uh, but you should be able to just see the outline of the woman's face and her hat and all that stuff. OK. Um, so just very quickly, some mathematical properties of the Fourier transform. It's linear which is to say if I take the Fourier transform of, and sorry about this, but I, my uh, notation changed up. So now instead of f of x's, we have x of t's. But here, this is the image. This is its Fourier coefficients. This is another image. This is its Fourier coefficients. So it's linear in the sense that you can take the Fourier transform of, uh, if you if you linearly combine two images, its Fourier transform is a linear combination of the two Fourier transforms of the original images. Uh, there is a scaling property that says that basically, if you overall make an entire image brighter by some constant factor alpha, then you can predict what is going to happen to the Fourier transform of that thing in a very easy to understand way. Um, it's separable in the sense that if your image is actually the product of a one one-dimensional image and another one, then uh, the Fourier transform is basically the product of the two one-dimensional images Fourier transforms. So these things all become important when you start doing more and more things with images. And for example, you might want to perform some action to an image and try to guess what will happen to its Fourier transform, which we will get back to on Wednesday, incidentally. Um, it's rotation invariant in the sense that if you take an image and you rotate it by some amount, you are essentially, you can figure out what the Fourier transform of it is just by rotating the original Fourier transform. Uh, right, so here's an important detail that I've kind of 
not really talked about uh, yet, which is that uh, photographs are not continuous things. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense to take the integral of an image with something because an image is only defined at discrete pixel values. It, the thing that you get off of your camera on your mobile phone is not a continuous representation like this thing, but a discrete set of values at discrete pixel locations like this one. So uh, it only so really what it's saying is that images or your imaging device can only capture spatial frequencies that are lower than a certain amount because they have a non-zero sampling frequency. And just to put this in a little bit plainer language, uh, uh, trying to represent image frequencies that are greater than the placing of, than the distance between these guys doesn't really make any sense. Because in between these two samples, you don't know if the image actually does this or whether it does this. So really it only makes sense to represent it in terms of lower frequencies than the spatial uh, packing together of pixels. And exactly how high of frequencies you can represent based on the spacing of your pixels, that's called Nyquist's theorem. So what this tells you is that this kind of it puts an innate cap on how high of frequencies you really need to keep track of given a particular image. So you don't have to have infinitely high frequency uh, sinusoids in your Fourier transform. OK, so oh, well, it's not quite the middle of the class, but here are the announcements anyway. Um, they're all pretty much repeated from Friday. So just uh, if you want to have the chance to have the course content tailored to your own specific uh, preferences and likes, please fill out a course survey. It's not required, but like I said, if enough people say they're interested in uh, face recognition, then I will do a lecture on face recognition. Up to you. Uh, if you are not enrolled, please enroll or get on the waiting list. Uh, as I've said, auditing is fine as long as there are seats. And at this moment, I think there are seats. Not physical seats, but you know, in terms of the, how many people are enrolled. Uh, on Friday, I will be, we will be handing out homework one. And it will be due, I think, three weeks after that. So basically, there's three weeks on each topic, and then the homework gets handed out near the beginning of that section, and you get about, about three weeks to work on it. But I will, you'll see that on Friday. And it, when I say handed out, that means on SmartSite. And I said this already, but um, so if you go to SmartSite right now, what you will see is the actual lecture that I gave on Friday the actual lecture I'm giving today, and then two years ago's version of all of the other lectures. So this is for you people who want to read ahead. I always feel bad that people who have really packed in quarters and want to jump ahead in one class so they can concentrate on another class, that they can't do that unless I put all the material online right now. So if you want to, you can read ahead, but the caveat is that all of the announcements are bogus. So they'll say, oh, you know, the Homework is due tomorrow, and you'll say, what? And, but that's because two years ago, the homework was due the day after I gave that lecture. So enough said. Uh, and the same is true of the homework assignments. So um, it, this is maybe even more important. So the homework assignments that are currently on SmartSite are from two years ago with all of the bugs and uh, minor typos and things that were there when I put them up. So uh, if you want to start on homeworks early, you should probably talk to me so that I can put, so, so that I can put the updated ones on there. Uh, sorry, any questions about administrative uh, types of, uh, yeah? So can we look ahead at future homeworks to see what they will be like, or are they going to be entirely different? No, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be the same up to typo level, bug level stuff. But yeah, the contents of them will be the same. Any other questions about uh, administration? OK, good. Well, very briefly, let's talk about uh, one possible generalization or one possible advance over the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform gives us a global sense of all the frequency characteristics of the entire image. So and one way you can think about this is that a sinusoid never stops. 
it, if starting from one end of the image, it's going, it's going, it's going, it covers the entire image. So in that sense, each of those sinusoids tells you something about the entire image in some way. So uh, you might instead want to isolate localized characteristics of the image. And I'll give you an example as to why. Let's say you have your image of the leopard, the cheetah, tiger looking thing anyway, uh, in one image. And then in the next image, it's the exact same image, except there's a bird flying overhead, okay? Most of the image is exactly the same, right? So most of your representation of that image should be entirely the same as well. However, what happens with the Fourier transform is that the Fourier transform of the cheetah-only image and the Fourier transform of the cheetah and bird image could be entirely arbitrarily different from each other, which is a little weird, right? We never think about images in this way, that an image that has one little thing added to it is completely... Uh, completely unrelated to an image that doesn't have that one thing added to it. So wavelets give you a way to kind of uh, get around that. So uh, here's how to do it. You basically use the exact same mechanics in terms of analysis and synthesis, but you use a different set of functions G. So if you remember, what you do is you take the inner product of your original image, with a set of functions that I call G1, G2, G3. And those things happen to be sinusoidal. Well, and I also said they don't have to be sinusoidal if you don't want to. <clears throat> Here's what you can do if you don't want to have sinusoidal functions. You can have ones that are localized in space. The cool thing about this is that if you have a one-dimensional image and you want to analyze it, you can analyze it using, for example, this function and this one and this one. And it shouldn't be hard for you to figure out that this function is going to tell you about this half of the image, and this function is going to tell you about this half of the image. So that if you have an image of a cheetah over here and nothing over here, then the, then the wavelet, it's called the wavelet transform of it, is going to be one thing. But if you add a bird to this part, the wavelet coefficients for this part aren't going to change. So this gets back to our intuition that an image that has had one little thing added to it is more or less the same thing. So um, this gives you an example of one particular what's called a wavelet basis or set of wavelet functions. There's, the jury is still out as to what particular shape they should be or what properties they should have. The, in terms of global representations of the image, the Fourier transform is kind of one. But in, in wavelets, there are different groups who use different, one, different uh, wavelet functions. So uh, the key thing here is that there's still no free lunch. You still have to try to strike a balance in some way. Um, there's a balance between being localized, in other words, not changing very much when different things are added to different spots of the image. But you also want to be concise. And so in an extreme case, you can imagine having one of these wavelet functions for each pixel in the image. But if you do that, then you haven't actually reduced the amount of data that's in the image at all. You lose that property that we had at the beginning, where an entire set of imaging data gets boiled down into just three numbers. So how to do this, trying to strike this balance between being localized and being concise, and also, by the way, we want to have that property of capturing salient image information. We want to be able to tell where edges are and where corners are and that kind of thing. It's currently a major research topic. And by the way, if any of you are familiar with JPEG, um, the thing that takes your huge image and chops it down into this little tiny file on disk called a JPEG image, that's wavelets. Um, and just for those of you who might be interested in neuroscience, um, it appears that one of the things that the human brain might be doing when it goes from uh, viewing a huge amount of imaging data to representing it in a compact way in the human brain, we might be doing something like a wavelet transform in some sense. So here are some examples, but as I've said, the jury is still out as to which one of these should be uh, used.
So just to summarize the overall point of this lecture, you can describe an image in terms of sinusoidal components, and, and this can be a useful way of talking about, telling the story of, explaining its low-level contents in terms of slowly varying and quickly varying intensities. Uh, and also, the Fourier transform is a, is a global thing, and, and there's a set of local versions of it that are called wavelet transforms. Any last-minute questions? Okay, well then we'll stop there. <laughs>